No problem. <clears throat> Terrible. <laughs> Question. Can the oldest living dogs teach us something important about the process of discovery? I believe they can, and that's why I'm up here on this stage today. But 40 days ago, I was in Homer, Alaska, visiting this dog, Kiri, on day one of the Old Gray Muzzle Tour, a 40-day scientific expedition cross-country where I studied the oldest living dogs in the United States in their homes. Why would we study these dogs so carefully? Because our goal is to better understand and unlock the secrets of highly successful aging and cancer resistance in both pets and people. And by the way, Kiri is the oldest dog that I met on my tour. And as a 15 and a half year old Rottweiler, she's physiologically equivalent to a 116 year old woman. So here I am up on the stage, day 40, upright, barely, but I'm feeling your energy. So I'm prepared to tell you some stories. And there are so many stories to tell. What will I tell you about my scientific expedition? Well, perhaps I'll tell you about some of the words that were in my eyes during my trip, road signs that I encountered in the 26 states and 18 interstate highways I traveled. Ah, Alaska, the threat of avalanche. Ah, Oklahoma. Apparently in Oklahoma, it's important to remind motorists that you shouldn't drive fast in areas where there's no visibility and something might be on fire. <laughs> and then finally, in the mountains of West Virginia, you see these types of words. And, and now, I love West Virginia, but you might get the impression why it's difficult for a traveler to find rest there. But we began studying Rottweilers, aging in Rottweilers in 1999, and that's when we collected a vast amount of medical and health information on over 800 dogs living in the United States and Canada. And it was th that time that we got the first glimpse of this tiny group of 21 Rottweilers who had lived to the age of 13, which would be equivalent to a 100-year-old person. And we know Rottweilers are a cancer-prone breed, but guess what? These 21 exceptionally long-lived dogs were cancer-resistant. So we knew right away we needed to study them more carefully, and that's why the Murphy Foundation Center for Exceptional Longevity Studies then began the first systematic study of the oldest living dogs in the United States, starting with Rottweilers. Now, what is the advantage of studying the oldest living dogs as opposed to oldest living people? Well, first of all, you can dress them up. <laughs> Here's Kiri from Alaska last Halloween. And she's dressed up as a sheep with little Bo Peep. And, and in my experience, uh, you find very few great grandmas that get jazzed up about Halloween anymore. But 100-year-old Rottweilers will very readily work for treats. But on a serious note, it's important to study these dogs because we think these dogs hold the keys to some important breakthroughs in cancer resistance. And that's because of our autopsy findings, and here's what we've learned. We know that Rottweilers are a cancer-prone breed. If a Rottweiler dies with usual longevity, which is about eight or nine years of age, cancer is the cause of death 80% of the time. But if these dogs live to be 100, then cancer is only the cause of death in 25% of the exceptionally long-lived Rotties. But what we've discovered at autopsy is more than 95% of these exceptionally long-lived dogs are actually harboring cancer at the time of autopsy. Sometimes two, three, four independent cancers. I didn't say harboring bone cancer that spread to four different organs. I said four different kinds of cancer. Holy crap. I just told you that the oldest living Rottweilers have figured out what every cancer scientist wants to figure out. How do you transform lethal cancer to a non-lethal nuisance? I say, let's make cancer like athlete's foot. We'll just walk around with a bit of it. 
But there's a second lesson. There's a second lesson that the oldest old Roddies want to teach us, and it has to do with stress and aging. Three weeks ago, on my tour, I gave a lecture at the University of Kentucky, and it was called Generating Scientific Hypotheses from the Living Room. And what I was trying to get across to these young scientists in training was that instead of being stranded in the laboratory, they needed to get out and make first-hand observations. If you want to innovate how children learn, you don't go back to your apartment and read a book on intelligence. You get your butt in a classroom and you observe firsthand how children learn. So when I visit these dogs in their homes, I spend about four hours studying them. I do a detailed physical examination, including neurologic exam, and I ask many, many questions. And during my visits, I'll ask the owner, so do loud noises like gunshot or thunderstorm stress your dog? The answer is usually no. How about the trip to the veterinarian's office? Is that stressful? The answer, no. How about strange people in the household? No. Okay, what is stressful to your dog? And oftentimes the owners have to think a long time. And finally, I remember one owner that came up with the reply, I think he's bothered by hot air balloons. <laughs> okay, so it might, be, it might be intuitive that the most highly successfully aging organisms have figured out some positive way of dealing with stress, but could we study the biology behind it? And the prevailing notion about aging and stress goes something like this. As we age, we get an increase in the levels of stress hormone, cortisol, in our blood. If you're a dog, a baboon, a human, and that pretty much takes care of everybody in the audience today, <laughs> as you grow older, you have increased levels of stress hormone, and that can do nasty things like suppress the immune system, decrease cognitive function, and also accelerate tumor growth. So, what we wanted to do was say, we went into the living room and we said, do these oldest old dogs that seem to handle stress so well, do you really think that they have elevated levels of stress hormone? Conventional wisdom would say they're ancient dogs. They should have very high cortisol levels. So what did we do? We measured for the first time cortisol levels in the oldest living dogs. We measured cortisol in 28 dogs nationwide, and this is no easy trick because at any given time, there's about 15 of these dogs that are alive in the United States, and they're sprinkled across the country. So... How many of the 28 oldest old dogs do you think had elevated cortisol? The answer is none. Well, I think that deserves a second reply. Uh, <laughs> none. None. So now, here's the second holy crap of the talk. Holy crap! The, the most highly successfully aging Rottweilers have figured out a way to sidestep the age-related increase in cortisol. More importantly, 40% of the dogs are walking around with low levels of cortisol. Okay, you say, that, that makes a little bit sense because these are ancient dogs. And maybe their adrenal glands that produce cortisol are wearing out. But we did something very clever in our study. We challenged each of these dogs by injecting them with a small amount of the pituitary hormone ACTH, which triggers cortisol release. And what did we find? All of these dogs that are walking around with low cortisol maintain a youthful response to challenge. If you wanted to win a 100-year race, you would not sprint it, would you? You would cool down the machine, but you would also want to retain a youthful response to challenge. And that's what these guys have figured out. And we're calling this low cortisol, youthful response retained situation, which has never been reported before, the adaptive secret. Adaptive meaning advantageous to the organism. 
secret, which comes from the Latin, meaning we don't have any freaking idea how the dogs are doing this. <laughs> but if my story ended there, we would miss out on the most important message of all, and that is to examine the meta message here. And this is the idea that was so eloquently stated by the general semanticist Wendell Johnson years ago. So the take home lesson for you all is that to be discovers, get the words out of your eyes. And what Johnson meant by that and what I believe strongly is that before you let the classifications, the categories, and the facts that have been poured into your head constrain your way of thinking, limit the way you see things. You need to get out and make first-hand observations. You need to explore the world first-hand. Get the words out of your eyes. Look at my story about stress and aging. Could we have identified an old but successfully aging population of individuals that sidestepped High cortisol? Yes, only if we got the words out of our eyes that said cortisol is an inextricable, obligate part of aging. We had to get out of the laboratory and into the living room to discover, to make sure progress in a world of uncertainty. And I'm going to close now with a story that is told of the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman. Feynman was at a dinner party one evening, and a lady came up to him and said, Mr. Feynman, I don't know how you do it as a physicist and a scientist. How do you deal with all the uncertainty? And Feynman leaned over and replied to the woman, Ma'am, it's the only world we've got. So, get out there in that uncertain world, you too can be a discoverer. You just have to get the words out of your eyes. Thank you.